May the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts, be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Again, good morning and grace and peace as we open on to the adventure of Easter season. The four Gospels have led us for the past weeks in a, an orderly and solemn procession, step by step through Holy Week. But then the sun comes up on Easter morning, and suddenly it's like fireworks exploding overhead all at once. Light and movement all over the place, wild and unexpected patterns, surprise after surprise after surprise. Uh, the disciples come to the tomb and find it empty. The women come to the tomb and meet an angel, or two angels. Mary meets him in the garden. Two old friends suddenly find themselves in his company as they walk home to Emmaus. He's there suddenly with them in the upper room despite locked doors. Twice, as we hear this morning. Or they see him by the Sea of Galilee on the shore near the very spot where he first called Peter and Andrew and James and John to join him in his ministry. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells of other Easter meetings, some of those not recorded in the four Gospels, uh, that he appeared to Cephas, to Peter, and then to the Twelve, and then he appeared to 500 brethren at one time, and then to James, and then to all the apostles. The sky overhead had gone dark, and then suddenly, everywhere, things are happening, exploding with light and sound. It's Easter everywhere. The church devotes 50 days to the season, from Easter Day to Whitsunday and Pentecost. It's the same sacred pattern of days. It's the 50 days between the night of Passover and the Feast of the Giving of the Law on Mount Sinai. We sort of need these seven weeks to hear the story, to take it all in, to allow these stories to rest in our hearts and our imagination. Most of the time, the basket of Easter eggs and candies will disappear after a day or two, but we take some time not to rush. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So this gathering in the upper room on the evening of Easter Sunday, in the first part of the reading that Ed read for us from John 20, I'm just going to be looking at the very first part of the reading today, verses 19 to 23. It's this, this wild moment, probably felt like there wasn't enough oxygen in the room for the disciples. It was hard for them to breathe. Cleopas and his companion must have just returned from Emmaus, rushing in to tell the others that they've had this strange and incomprehensible meeting of Jesus on their way home. And then, all at once, there he is, Jesus himself. The room falls silent. Irene umin. That's John's Greek. Probably Jesus said to them, Shalom, shalom. His familiar greeting, peace be with you. They can't believe their eyes. They can't believe what they're hearing. We, we picture it and see the astonished look on their faces. He lifts up his hands and shows them his scars. He pulls up his shirt to show where the Roman soldier's spear had pierced his side. They can't believe what they are seeing. And yet, can there be any doubt? He's right here. And then he speaks again. Irene umin, shalom, shalom, peace, peace to you. And then three things, three things that John tells us in this story, three words to his disciples. First, he turns to his disciples and says, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. The apostolic commission. Back in their earlier journey to Jerusalem, he had sent them on ahead two by two. On the Mount of the Ascension, he would send them again. Go ye into all the world. 
It's a recurring theme of these Easter meetings with Jesus. We would remember how at the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter wanted to build three shelters on the mountaintop. He didn't want to leave. He wanted to stay up there at the top of the mountain. He didn't want to go back to the world of conflict and strife just to bask in the glory of the Father and the brilliance of the Son, the embrace of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what Jesus had in mind for them then. They just took a breath and headed back down the mountain. And so it is on Easter Sunday. Uh, Lord, we would stay here with you in this room. But we remember what he said to Mary in the garden. Don't hold on to me, but go and tell the others. Here again, as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. It's not Pentecost yet, but it's already Pentecost. And then the second word, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. It's a foreshadowing of what would happen in that same upper room when the 50 days had passed and the Spirit would rush in with a great sound of wind and would rest over them like tongues of fire and fill them with energy that would power their proclamation to the ends of the earth. Receive the Holy Spirit. And then he turns to them and says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Sadducees and Pharisees were absolutely correct when in their astonishment they raised their chief objection to Jesus. Preaching, teaching, healing, that's one thing. But they said to him, only God can forgive sins. And they are absolutely correct. They just didn't know who it was who was standing before him. So in this word, the whole mystery of the cross is established in a new reality of Easter. That as Christ has taken upon himself every sin, every dark power, the whole weight of the prince of this world, and with his death has accomplished a total victory, so now that power of mercy, the triumph of blessing, is fully expressed in his living body, the church, the whole company of faithful people. As we stand at the cross and offer him our brokenness, we are incorporated into him and into his resurrection. And there is new birth and new life. This is how his mercy is to be made known. This is why he sends us out for the same reason that the Son was sent from the Father for blessing, for grace, and for forgiveness. My friend Wes Hill, who teaches New Testament, wrote an article recently uh, reviewing a new book by a guy named Rod Dreher called The Benedict Option. Anytime somebody writes about St. Benedict, I'm always interested in reading uh, what they have to say. But a bit of what Wes said in his review really stood out for me. He said, the beauty of holiness isn't about us always getting it right. It's about us striving for holiness while not covering our sin, not lying about our lives. It's about us seeking always again and again to live lives of repentance and dependence upon his forgiving love. Bare morality, he says, shorn of its rationale and distinctive motivations, isn't our primary Christian gift to the world. But there is one distinctive thing that we have to offer. There is only one place in the world where you can hear words of absolution that assure us that God in Christ is a God of prodigal mercy. Prodigal mercy. That place is right here. It is to be so. In the circle of his church, his body, those who have beheld his glory, those who have received grace upon grace, who have stood at the foot of the cross, who have laid down the burden of sin before him, and now who are filled to overflowing and made one body with him, one body, that he might dwell in us and we in him. We ransomed, healed, restored, 
and forgiven. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. If the world thinks that that that's beyond you, uh, it's just because they don't know who it is that is standing before them, who you are now, who you have become, you and me and I and you. As I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. We are very members and corporate in the mystical body through faith in the work of his cross. That's Easter, real Easter, 50 days, 365 days. We're invited, as the disciples were on that first evening of Easter, to take some deep breaths and to let it begin to sink in. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.